you ever been enslaved and then given release? Oh, freedom. Have you ever felt burdened by your past and its pain as real as a heavy ball chained to your leg? And then, for a time or for forever, the weight disappeared. Oh, freedom. Have you been stooped over under worry for the future, the bills, the illness, the perilous path that your loved one is walking, and then your worry lifted by some unexpected thing happening or by prayer? Oh, freedom. Some years ago, I was gripped by a huge worry, a panic really, about what seemed an insoluble problem, a big decision that needed to be made about one of our children. And we parents who both loved the child with all of our hearts were on opposite sides of what we thought was best. We'd gone around and around and around. There was no escape as I saw it. I'd either be taking a stand against something my beloved husband felt very strongly about, or I'd be harming my child. The two relationships most central in my life, my marriage and my parenting, were in conflict and the burden was awful. One night I prayed and prayed. One of those nights I will never forget, I was begging for some way out, and then the next day, a completely unexpected solution arose. As unreal, as unimagined as the Red Sea parting so that those Hebrews enslaved to Pharaoh in Egypt could escape their slavery, an enormous relief. Oh, freedom. Slavery comes in many guises, but one thing is clear. God always wants to liberate us. That's the message of today's stories. God, the liberator, there's a new door open. We can breathe again and the waters part. We can make it to the other side. Freedom. Apostle Paul experienced it and he was bursting to share it, traveling thousands of miles all around the Mediterranean with this message. God doesn't demand perfection following every rule. Even he who had messed up before would never be separated from God's love. That was sweet, sweet freedom for him. So Paul wrote a letter to the people of Galatia in the middle of Turkey saying, you have this freedom too. But it's not the freedom to do whatever you want, to be cruel or uncaring. True freedom is based on the certainty that you are valued, that God's love is yours and others, so you no longer are driven by what other people think of you, no longer enslaved to fears or competition or envy. When you are most free, says Paul, most able to be who you were meant to be, then what will flow naturally are these things, love and joy and peace and patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. You'll have freedom, freedom from what has ensnared you, but also not just freedom from, but freedom to, freedom to love fully and generously, the deepest, truest freedom of all, says Paul. An old man was dying from cancer that couldn't be cured and he chose to stop treatments so he could spend his remaining time seeing people rather than keeping doctor's appointments. His comment to a visitor was how blessed his life had been because he'd had the opportunity to love many people. The visitor thought he'd misheard. Didn't the old man mean he'd had the chance to be loved by many people? Well, he said, I have been loved, but my thanks is that I could love others. It's been a great gift. This old man understood Paul's message that it was a gift that he'd been able to give love away. He'd had the freedom, the opportunity, the time, the energy in his life to love other people. It's what had given his life meaning. The Old Testament, as well as Paul in the New Testament, always links freedom to what it enables us to do. The people we're allowed to become when we're free, no longer enslaved. The central story of Judaism, of course, was referenced in that passage with Elijah and Elisha and the crossing 
of the river. You heard it. The central story is the story of a faithful God who heard the people's cry when they were slaves in Egypt and brings them out to freedom. So at the Passover Seder year after year, Jews to this day gather to read again of that confrontation between the Egyptian king Pharaoh and Moses, the Jews, very human and initially reluctant leader. By God's grace and by God's might, the Jews escape when the waters of the Red Sea part and their scared group of children and men and women could cross over to the other side safely. While the frightening, powerful chariots of the Pharaoh sank in the mud, oh, freedom. The Exodus is the core of the Jewish text. So many other Bible stories riff on this theme, saying it's still true today, a story that keeps repeating. God still hears our cries. God still yearns for our freedom. God still keeps, helps us cross the churning waters. God still delivers. In the story of Elijah and Elisha, we see the pattern. We've been reading about them for the last several weeks. They are the prophets, the human leaders like Moses. And God enables each of them to cross over the Jordan today, symbolically. This time, though, the tyrant against from whom the people need freedom is no longer a foreign pharaoh, but the Israelites' own corrupt king who's forgotten what their freedom is for. Freedom out of Egypt was not a gift from God so that generations later, the free people of God could do whatever they could get away with. Freedom was not a license for the kings of Israel to amass as much for themselves as they could on the back of their people. Freedom obtained by love, by God, by grace, has these attributes. It's generous and gentle and filled with peace. The chief duty of the kings of Israel in God's eyes is to ensure justice and to care for the people, the poor, the children, the widows. When Israel had been first birthed as a nation, right after the Exodus, they'd established laws that had those parameters, giving rights even to those who were enslaved. Why? Because the ancient text said, text said, we remember that we were once slaves too. Freedom so that freedom can be shared. Elijah and Elisha thunder out against the corrupt and greedy kings, the new pharaohs. Remember who God is, who gave you this land. Those given freedom are also given responsibility. In the words of another prophet, what does the Lord require of thee? But to do justly and to love kindness and to walk humbly before thy God. Love as our God loves, said Elijah and Elisha to the kings, caring for the most vulnerable. The Old Testament stories always cycle back to the question, which side are you on? Are you on God's side or Pharaoh's? Whoever today's Pharaoh might be. What enslaves you or your nation today? What are you using your freedom for? They're good questions for all of us. In America, we've long recognized that freedom is not just freedom from something, but also freedom for some purpose. We need freedom from a king, we said at the time of our revolution, so that we can achieve this self-evident truth that all men are created equal. At our best, America has known that freedom is a gift not just for ourselves, but to be shared. Give me your tired, your poor, those yearning to be free, the huddled masses. We sought a commonwealth akin to the Boston Common where everyone could leave, let their animals graze, some shared opportunity for all. We've said that we're driven not only by liberty, freedom, but also by equality, liberty and equality. This week in England, the majority exercised their freedom of the vote to get freedom from the European Union, freedom from the EU towards what end? To ensure themselves more goods and others less. Who is Pharaoh? Where is God in that equation? Who was Pharaoh and where was God when so many of America's white Christians enslaved black Africans and American natives. Using the argument that because we whites are no longer enslaved to England's ancient strictures about who could have land, even we lesser men could become wealthy, and that meant that Americans were free to aggrandize themselves at the expense of others. 
We made ourselves the new pharaohs. And God's heart broke. Slaves understood God's gift of freedom better than their masters. All week long, slaves were told they were nothing, not even human, but on Sundays when they gathered to worship a God, they were reminded he was their father, loving them beyond measure, who did hear their cries and would free them too. For some, says Howard Thurman, the wonderful former dean of the BU Chapel, the only imaginable escape from the horror of their daily lives was death, God's chariot, as we just sang, coming to take them home to heaven. A very hard song that that was their only escape. But Thurman says that their trust in a godly heaven had to be unshakable to survive the harsh, cruel life, that the slave's powerful, clear Christianity was needed to redeem the distorted and corrupted Christianity of their masters and those who accepted slavery in silence. For some slaves, the chariot might come as they lived, and some interpret swing low, sweet chariot as if it were in code. The chariot might be the mode of transportation known as the Underground Railroad. That's what was coming to take them home, home to the north. The band of angels coming after me might be those courageous souls who ushered escaping slaves to safe houses, who knew that God never gave freedom to some in order to grow wealthy at the expense of others they enslaved. Freedom. It's what American slaves always deserved, fought for, sang out for, courageously escaped for. Freedom. It's what desperate refugees want now in Africa and Syria and Latin America. Freedom, not the license to do anything we want, whether or not it harms others, but the freedom that makes us all better people, each able to hope again, make a home again, be valued again, live again as honored and precious in the sight of God. Oh, freedom, we all yearn for it. What do you need freedom from? And have you asked God or spirit or the universe, love, whatever name you use, have you asked that power beyond us for the freedom you need. Is there a river you must cross over with waters running deep and swift and you've been relying on the wrong thing, one of Pharaoh's earthly chariots, as if that could get you to the other side? Is there a path that's been cleared through the waters already, a door standing open and you've been afraid to walk through? The God of Paul, the God of Elijah and Elisha and Moses, the God of freedom, yearns for your freedom. The best chariot towards that freedom, the truest one, is never Pharaoh's chariot, weighted down with all its trappings, the one that gets mired in the Red Sea mud. But there is God's chariot that thunders from heaven, able not just to cross waters, but to actually rise up and fly. What a metaphor for what we can be given. God's chariot doesn't just usher us toward the freedom of a place or a plot of land. It takes us to the most free place of all, our truest home, where we're meant as humans to dwell, united to God, filled with the Spirit, not only after death, but now. Paul would say that God's fiery presence swoops down to us, just like at Pentecost, that God's fiery chariot carries us along. God's fire, God's Spirit so can fill us that the fruits that will shine out from us as bright as fire are these. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, true freedom as God yearns to give it to you. It is there for you, it's there for all. Receive it freely, live it fully, now and forevermore, and the world will see it shine through like a chariot of fire. Amen.